Today we're going to talk about cestodes or tapeworms that infect humans. In some general characteristics, tapeworms are flat and ribbon-like, segmented, hermaphroditic, and humans are the definitive host. And they have different uh, names for different parts of the body itself. The head or the scolex is at one end and it has suckers and some have hooklets for attachment. The whole of the body is called the strobola. And then there's the proglottids, which closer to the scolex, they are immature. And farther away they get, they become more mature all the way down to the gravid, which are the egg producing um, segments of the tapeworm. Each mature proglottid contains male and female reproductive organs. Some general information about the egg stage. For the most part, the eggs contain a hexacanth embryo, a sixth hooked embryo. There's a motile first stage larva and the eggs are infectious, meaning they can reinfect you or infect others immediately after being shed in the feces. The first tapeworm we're going to talk about is Hymenolepsis nana, also known as the dwarf tapeworm. It's most common in children, and children and others infect, are get infected by accidentally ingesting the dwarf tapeworm eggs. Ingesting fecally contaminated foods or water by touching your mouth with your contaminated fingers or by ingesting contaminated soil are all ways uh, to get infected with the egg. People can also become infected if they accidentally ingest an infected arthropod, uh, an in which can be an intermediate host such as a small beetle or mealworm that has gotten into food. The symptoms of H. nana. Most people who are infected do not have any symptoms. Those who have symptoms may experience nausea, weakness, loss of appetite, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Young children, especially those with heavy infection, may develop a headache, itchy bottom, and have difficulty sleeping. Sometimes infection is misdiagnosed as a pinworm infection based on the symptoms. And this is the scolex of Hymenolepsis nana, and it has the four suckers. There's two of them you can see here. And it has an armed rostellum, so it has uh, the hooklets on the rostellum. Diagnosis is made by identifying the dwarf tapeworm eggs in stool. The eggs are oval with a colorless outer layer and smaller than those of H. diminuta, something we're going to talk about next. And they have a size range of about 30 to 50 microns. On the inner membrane are two poles, so it's bipolar, from which four to eight polar filaments spread out in between the two membranes. The onchosphere has six hooklets. Hymenolepsis diminuta, also known as the rat tapeworm. In addition to humans, rodents are definitive hosts. Humans can be accidentally infected through the ingestion of insects. Uh, coprophilic arthropods, commonly cockroaches, beetles, and fleas, which all serve as the intermediate host. And they can be found in pre-cooked cereals or other food items and directly from the environment. So oral exploration of the environment by children is another way a child can pick up the egg of Hymenolepsis diminuta. Symptoms. H. diminuta is often asymptomatic. However, abdominal pain, irritability, itching, and eosinophilia are among the existing symptoms in a few of the reported cases. Diagnosis. These eggs are round or slightly oval uh, 70 to 85 microns by 60 to 80 microns with a bile stain outer membrane and a thin inner membrane. 
So clearly they are larger than Hymenolepsis nana. Now the space between the membranes is smooth or faintly granular. The oncosphere has six hooks. Unlike Hymenolepsis nana, Hymenolepsis diminuta, there are no polar filaments extending from the space between the oncosphere and the outer shell. Tinea species. Teniasis in humans is a parasitic infection caused by the tapeworm species Tinea saginata or the beef tapeworm and Tinea solium or the pork tapeworm. Humans become infected with these tapeworms by eating raw or undercooked beef in the case of Tinea saginata or pork in the case of Tinea solium. People with teniasis may not know they have a tapeworm infection because symptoms are usually mild or non-existent. Humans are the definitive host while cattle and pigs are the intermediate host. The adults reside in the human intestine. Uh, eggs and proglottids, proglottids that are full of eggs, are passed in the environment. They're ingested by the intermediate host, a pig or a cattle. The oncosphere hatches, penetrates the intestinal wall, and is carried in blood to the tissue of the pig or the cattle. And they develop into cystocircus in the tissue, which, in the case of undercooked pork or undercooked beef, these could be eaten by people. The symptoms and pathology. People with teniasis may not know they have a tapeworm because it's usually mild or maybe non-existent. Now patients with tinea saginata often experience more symptoms than those with tinea solium because tinea saginata is much larger in size. So we're talking up to 10 meters or more than 30 feet long, while tinea solium is usually about three meters. Now tapeworms can cause digestive problems including abdominal pain, loss of appetite, weight loss, and upset stomach. The most visible symptom of teniasis is the active passing of the proglottids, these different segments of the tapeworm, through the anus and in the feces. In rare cases, tapeworm segments can be lodged in the appendix or bile or pancreatic ducts. Infection with teniasolium tapeworms can result in human cystocercosis which can be a very serious disease that can cause seizures in the brain, muscle, or eye damage. Now, sister cercosis is the most serious manifestation of uh, the pork tapeworm, Tinea solium, and it is considered one of the neglected tropical diseases. Humans, in this case, serve as the intermediate host, and this is when the eggs are ingested the eggs hatch and the larvae migrate to any organ. It could be the brain, that would be neurocystocercosis. The diagnosis of neurocystocercosis is usually um, done by MRI or CT brain scans. A very serious disease, you can have seizures, mental disturbances, focal neurologic deficits, and signs of space occupying intracerebral lesions and death can occur. Diagnosis. The eggs of tinea species are indistinguishable from each other. So if you have an egg under a microscope, you cannot determine whether it's tinea solium or tinea saginata based on its morphology. They're identical. The eggs measure about 30 to 35 micro, um, micrometers in diameter and are radially striated on the outside shell. The internal aquasphere contains six refractile hooks. Now, separation of tinea saginata and tinea solium is best accomplished by examination of the mature proglottids. Tinea saginata has 15 to 30 primary lateral uterine branches, while tinea solium has 7 to 13. They can be visualized, the branches that is, um, by clearing the specimen in lactophenol, followed by 
injecting India ink into the genital pore. And in the case of this picture, you can see how the India ink has filled up um, the uterine branches. The Scolex is also different for the uh, two species. On the left-hand side, the Scolex of Tinea solium contains four large suckers and an armed rostellum. And here, four suckers, the rostellum with hooklets. Well, on the right, the Scolex of Tinea saginata has four large suckers, but lacks the rostellum and the hooklets. And this is just a photo from you know, a hundred years ago, uh, when snake oil salesmen would be selling sanitized tapeworm eggs for weight loss. And to believe it or not, this still goes on to this day. Echinococcus. This is a parasitic disease caused by infection with tiny tapeworms of the genus Echinococcus. Disease results from being infected with the larval stage of Echinococcus granulosus a tiny tapeworm, it's about two to seven millimeters in length, which is found in dogs, which are the definitive host. They can be found in sheep, cattle, goats, foxes, and pigs, among other herbivores intermediate hosts. Humans, which are the accidental intermediate host, become infected by ingesting eggs with resulting release of aquaspheres in the intestine and the development of cyst, hydatid cyst, and other various organs. Most primary infections in humans consist of a single cyst. The liver is the most common site of a hydatid cyst, followed by the lungs. The presence of a cyst-like mass in a person with a history of exposure to sheepdogs in an area where E. granulosis is endemic suggests a diagnosis of cystic echinococcosis. Imaging techniques such as CT scans, ultrasound, and MRIs are used to detect the cyst. After a cyst has been detected, serological tests may be used to confirm the diagnosis. And here on the left hand side you do see a picture of the hydatid cyst that was taken out of a person. And on the right hand side you can see under the uh, imaging test, the hydatid cyst in the brain. And then there's Diphilobothrium latum, also known as the fish or broad tapeworm. This is the largest tapeworm that infects humans and can grow up to 45 feet long. Diphilobothriasis occurs in the northern hemisphere. So Europe, northern Europe, North America, parts of Asia, um, parts of South America, Uruguay, and Chile. The freshwater fish infected with Diphilobothrium larva may be transported to and consumed in geographic areas where active transmission does not occur, resulting in human Diphilobothriasis. And just going over the life cycle really quickly, um, the immature eggs are passed in the feces of an infected human they mature in the water in about three weeks. The larva, uh, called Coracidia, hatch, and they get eaten by freshwater crustaceans, such as a copepod. After ingestion, the Coracidia develop into a procercoid larva. If the copepod is eaten by a small fish, which is a second intermediate host, the procercoid larva penetrate the gut and migrate to muscle tissue where they develop into pleurocercoid larva, or sparginum, the infective stage for humans. And usually a third intermediate host is needed because people don't usually eat these tiny, tiny, small fish. But if a trout or a pike or a perch eat the smaller fish, the pleurocercoid larva once again penetrate the gut and migrate to the fish flesh. If a person eats the infected raw fish or undercooked, the pleurosorca larva develops into adults in the small intestine. One tapeworm of Diphilobothrium latum can shed up to 1 million eggs per day, and it can grow over 10 meters long and live up to 20 years. 
Now, most infections with diphyllobothrium are asymptomatic. However, symptoms can include abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, vomiting, and weight loss. Now, vitamin B12 deficiency leading to pernicious anemia may occur, and this is a notorious uh, pathology of diphyllobothrium latum. In addition, complications include intestinal obstruction and gallbladder disease caused by the migration of proglottids. Diagnosis. Diphyllobothrium species eggs are oval or ellipsoid and range in size from about 55 to 75 microns by 40 to 50 microns in width. There is an operculum at one end that can be inconspicuous and at the opposite end, a abopercular end, a small knob that can barely be seen. This egg is sometimes difficult to distinguish from uh, the oriental lung fluke, Paragonimus westermani. And here's just a couple more pictures. Right here in the upper right hand corner, we have the scolex of Diphyllobothrium latum, and hence the name. It has two slit like uh, suckers and no rostellum. And here's the proglottid, and hence the, broad, the nickname the broad tapeworm. It has uh, much wider than long. Uh, proglottids, and it has a very characteristic rosette uterus, as you can see there. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.